day to night. And, and for those of you that um, live on the West Coast, think of me at this time tomorrow, because we'll probably be pitch dark at this time tomorrow here in Connecticut. Um, oh, isn't that terrible? Awful, awful. Uh, but I wanted to start um, and sort of get right into it with you, Lance, and okay. um, becoming familiar with your books. I was certainly impressed and uh, with the way that you've constructed this universe, uh, the DeWitt Agency. And to me, it's a sort of a brilliant and unique way that I've seen to do a series. Um, you know, a lot of series are sort of the same character over and over which lends itself to sort of the joke about murder she wrote, which is, you know, she's probably not the world's greatest detective, but maybe the world's greatest serial killer, because everywhere she goes, there are dead bodies in her past. Right. You've taken this, this unique right. approach, I think, which is that you have secondary characters who then dominate a novel. And I was just wondering if you could briefly talk about the DeWitt agency, sort of how you came up with the idea and especially how you sort of came up with the idea to take a character like Carson, who is secondary in the first three novels and make her a dominant character going forward. Okay. Uh, I started out with two standalones, uh, both thrillers. And everybody was telling me, oh, you have to have a series. You have to have a series. That's the only way you're ever gonna make any money. And I said, oh, all right. Um, because I, I'd read series and I was, you know, not thrilled by the idea because usually by book four or five, they're running out of ideas and they're starting to recycle plots and so forth. So I figured, well, okay, how am I going to do this so I don't get bored with my own series? Uh, and I started thinking the, the way that I normally do when I'm trying to put together a protagonist is, okay, what, what do I need to have done? And at the time I was getting interested in crimes involving art and crimes against art. And there's a, this whole world involved in that. And it's a, a really interesting environment. And there were starting to get to be books about crimes against art uh, that were interesting. So I thought, okay, let's do that. So I'm gonna have somebody who gets involved in crimes against art. So who is this guy? And then I came up with Matt Friedrich, uh, who is an architect by training. Uh, his, his career basically got destroyed by the 2008 economic crash. He had to get a job. And so he got a job as a gallery assistant in Los Angeles, and it was a crooked gallery. So he learned the art world the worst possible way he could possibly do it. I got busted, spent some time in the you know, government's club med in, Fort, in um, Pensacola and is out and is, you know, doesn't have any career prospects, doesn't have anything like that. So I said, okay, where do we go from there? Now I know that typically in you know, some of these, you have the amateur detective and he inserts himself into a, uh, investigation or something that he has absolutely no business being involved in. And then you end up three or four books down the road having the Jessica Fletcher problem where this guy's always popping up and you know, sticking his nose in places. So I will, how would I get him involved in this in a way that is actually credible? I was saying, okay, well, who's going to hire this guy? It's going to be somebody else who's crooked. And that got me to the point of the DeWitt agency. Uh, Matt had met Allison DeWitt, who's the owner of the agency, several years before. They had a one-night stand. And she was sort of interested in hiring him, and he didn't go that way. So he finds her business card and writes her an email and said, remember how you were interested in hiring me? Well, I'm interested in having that happen. So finally she does. And the DeWitt agency is not a private detective agency. It's not a police agency. 
Uh, it's kind of concierge uh, doing things for people who can afford the agency uh, to fill needs for them. And so now when he hires on, he becomes their art crimes expert. And there's all these other uh, associates who work for the agency and they're all contractors and they show up. And the idea that I had behind this is that there would be this whole group of people that we would get to know one way or another. And then if I got tired writing Matt stories, I could take one of the other ones and spin them off and either do uh, do agency files, which are kind of the investigations, the con jobs, uh, that kind of thing. Or I could do in an alternate series where there's more action, more adventure. Uh, the thriller series, which became the DeWitt Agency Adventures. And so that's what I did with Carson. I wrote the three map books and said, okay, I'm, I'm tired of living in this guy's head and I want to do something else. And everybody seems to like Carson. So I thought, okay, now it's time for Carson to have her own books. So I, I spun off the DeWitt Agency Adventures series and now she's had her two books. Uh, there, there will continue to be other characters coming up uh, in... Zerato, which was the first Carson book, and then also now in the second one, there's a, a Russian Special Forces guy that she meets and gets involved with, and the implication is that eventually he might become an associate, and then he might have his own stories. Uh, and this is the only way that I could think of of doing this and keeping the world going without boring myself to tears with doing the same stuff over and over again. You know, or boring the reader. So, so when you when you first introduced Carson, were you thinking that Carson might be a character for a, for a novel, or did that sort of come more organically as you went? I I think it came more as uh, as we went along because I didn't know how people would react to her. Uh, she is not the typical crime novel thriller female <laughs> character. I. Uh, and so I didn't know if people would actually be able to connect with her. And apparently they do, which is nice. Uh, and so as time went by and after the second book, Stealing Ghosts, uh, and people were saying, you know, we need more Carson. We want more Carson. And they, people were disappointed that she didn't show up in Chasing Clay, except on the phone. And so I thought, okay, that's a good indication that maybe people might buy Carson books. So I started those I thought you had and, and, and can you go back to a little bit about um sort of your relationship with art art history and why that that interested you in terms of of looking at crime it, it certainly is a a lot of information out there and you in i think in most of your novels some of that some of the crime is based upon actual thefts i know that you right there's a Netherlands museum heist that you sort of use. You replay, you put it in a different part of the world, but it is based upon actual events. Right. Uh, you know, there's a lot of true crime out there, and a lot of it is about serial killers, and serial killers really bore me. Uh, I'm not really all that fond of complete nutters, but there was something about the the various kinds of art crime that were out there that appealed to me. I had the art thing going, and then I also had, it was more like financial crime. And I always liked the financial thrillers, uh, you know, Crash of 79, Crash of 82, Silver Bears, uh, Paul Erdman's books from the 80s and, and so forth. And so I like the idea that we have these major crimes going down that don't involve people getting killed in really outre ways. And there's so many different aspects to it. I, one of the things that I wanted when going into the series is that you know, I don't want him always, I don't want Matt always trying to do the same thing, always trying to find the stolen painting or always trying to, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so there's all kinds of different aspects in it, and some of them are fairly obscure, but that I'd be able to pull from. And then there's actual cases that I could pull from, like you mentioned, with the, um, the thefts from the 
Museum in the Netherlands, which formed the underpinnings of Zerata. Uh, so that's why I, I focused in on that. Also, there aren't a whole lot of other series out there that are dealing with crimes against art. So I thought it was something that would be unique and would help me stand apart. Just as a, as a callback, I have a casual mention in my book, which is about a couple of thieves, and they mention a fairly famous heist. I think it's in France where the, the thief basically used a screwdriver, a pry bar, and an X-Acto knife and was able to go in and basically steal a ton of art. And it's yes. like, it seems, seems like a lot of those heists are very low tech. They're not like what you see in the movies. And yes. Yes, that's true. There was another big one where thieves got into the Van Gogh Museum in, I can't remember what city it's in now. Uh, but anyway, they've just busted, you know, climbed up to the roof and busted a window and got in. He wrote a, was, another novel and he have a reading today and this was today. No. Yeah, it was during our, um, this is in New York. Hey. This is old time book publishers. Stacy, you may need to mute. Oh, that's Greg. Oh, <laughs> sorry, Lance. Oops, that's okay. So, so, how much how much research do you do into the art world? How much of that did you know going in? How much do you look at as you're writing? I picked up the generalities just on my own. It was something that I was doing just for kind of recreation. And then when I focus on a plot, uh, I'll have an idea that I got from the general reading. And so I'll take that and think, okay, well, what do I need to know in order to do this story? And so I'll go into the actual case to get th what really happened and then start looking around the edges of that to figure out what could have happened and how do I play this out to make it more of an interesting story. So for instance, the collection, which was the first book in the DeWitt Files series, is actually based on things that go on. The whole thing with the mafia having a cache of stolen art that they use for uh, moving money, laundering money, and using as collateral for drug deals was is actually true. That really happened. So I found that out and we thought, oh, that's cool. We can do that. And we got the mafia and you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so then I started reading about how that works and got into how money laundering through art works and then getting around some of the import export controls on art. And that was how I was able to put that together. Uh, stealing ghosts. Uh, I came up with the idea of, of that after the movie, the woman in gold came out. And so that was the happy ending movie. That was, you know, somebody was able to get their, you know, lost, you know, dead family from the Holocaust uh, art back after working the legal system and getting it, it back. And I knew by that point that that wasn't a normal story. Uh, normally people would, they'd finally find the thing and they'd get into this endless legal wrangle. Yeah. And at the end, you know, statute of limitations would be over or, you know, some some national court would say, well, no, you can't do that because now it's owned by the government and, you know, blah, 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 like that. So I thought, okay, what would have happened if Maria Altman had lost the woman in gold case? What, where we would have gone from then? Yes. Then I started thinking, okay, well, how else would you get it back? And that's where I came up with the... Uh, grandchild who is now a corporate CEO and can afford to hire the DeWitt agency to get his painting back and he doesn't really care how they get it back and that got okay yeah and so that's um that's how that happened so um and Anna is saying I should not be monopolizing this conversation <laughs> So I'm going to ask right. you, I'm All going right. to ask hang you on a one, question. Hang on one second, though. I have something that, okay. that I want to ask you since, since I may not have the opportunity again, which is I read a number of years ago that most art that is stolen is actually forgeries, that in fact, most museums, what you see on the wall are not the actual 
artworks themselves, but are either reproductions or forgeries. Do you have any knowledge on that aspect? You know, there's there's a lot of allegations about that. There are there have been some very prolific forgers out there uh, and who were very successful. And so there is some feeling that, especially on contemporary art, there's a great deal of contemporary art out there that wasn't done by the guy whose signature is on the bottom of it. Uh, there is also something, antiquities, uh, the antiquities trade is really dirty. Uh, it's been said that up to 90% of the antiquities in American museums have been uh, looted and smuggled. So there's that also. Now, once you start getting into older art, uh, it's it's harder for the forgeries to survive that kind of scrutiny. Uh, but for contemporary art, because it is such a frothy market and it's also very hot, there's more incentive to forge uh, contemporary you know, modern modern artists who are names. Yeah, it's also my understanding that if a museum spends X millions of dollars on a piece of art, they don't really want it publicized that they bought a forgery and yes. a sort of a, sort of a game that they play. If everybody acknowledges that it's real, then at some point it becomes real. Yes. Otherwise, it ends up in their collection that's off display, and you just never see it again. So. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So I wanted to start start out with a question here. You said about just thieves. I had no idea where it was going. I started with the scene of two people sitting in a car talking about the value of things, which led me to think of them as thieves who had stolen something they shouldn't have stolen. Uh, with As Simple as Snow, which was your first novel, you said, I didn't know how the book would end when I started it. I didn't even know it was going to be a novel. These are not the words of a plotter. <laughs> So do you consider yourself a pantser and, and how did that come about? Um, well, the first, the first novel, I had sort of, sort of uh, resigned myself that I would never write a novel. And I had written short stories and had been writing a lot of short stories and sort of thought that's where I lived. And then this idea came into my head. Um, and just started writing and then sort of just kept writing afraid that I would lose momentum and then at some point realized it was a novel and just kept going kept going um so that was like you know blind determination to get something done without having any idea of how to do it or how to really what the story was and um I hate to say that's sort of my approach which is that I don't sit down and think about structure plot anything like that I sort of think about characters first and the, as you mentioned uh that quote is I it was this conversation that these two guys were having and out of that conversation I realized that they were thieves um and somewhat like you the much low rent version than yours they work for someone else uh bespoke thievery someone tells them to go get an object they go find it and you know they usually know where it is they just have to figure out how to get it and bring it back to their boss um and so I had this first scene and um sort of just started writing on the front side of that and the scene that that I mentioned ends up being about 60 pages into the novel so you know the initial scene that I wrote ended up being in there and then you know much like much like having conversations with people a lot of a lot of it came about from these two characters talking to each other and their relationship their characters sort of were revealed to me and i became more and more interested in them their backstories and and obviously what happens after they steal this object that they shouldn't take okay and so your your novels just kind of grow you, you don't they sit grow. down and plot them. And... They grow. My agent calls it the cotton candy approach to writing, which is it's just <laughs> one little piece of sugar that gets spun around until it becomes this thing. Okay. So the end comes as I don't much recommend. I don't recommend it as an approach, <laughs> but it, it sort of worked for me for these three. Oh, okay. Did did you learn that at your MFA you program, or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is, or is that, that is a reaction funny. to your MFA I program? It was more a reaction to the MFA program. 
Okay. Um, now you call Just Thieves uh, Noir, and I know that you're a, a Noir fan. Uh, some of the uh, the writers that you've mentioned when people have asked you, you know, who are the writers who inspire you uh, are from the heyday of classic noir. I was wondering, are there any modern day noir writers who you enjoy or admire? And if there aren't, why not? Um, there are some. George Higgins is certainly top of mind. I love George Higgins. And, um, you know, I think have an affinity to him because he does a lot of his telling through dialogue. Um, but, you know, I have to say it's like I'm not as well versed in the modern stuff as I am from the classic stuff. Um, there's certainly people from the 50s, 50s, 60s that I love, but current stuff, you know, Chris Offit just wrote sort of a noir novel that I love, James Salas, who, who I love. Those are people in the Richard Price, which I don't know if technically is noir, but certainly of the hard boiled vein. Um, you know, and uh, uh, Pierce from the UK, who did that series um of the 1979 series red riding hood i think was how it was sort of translated into the screen those are more oh, contemporary. red writing yeah yeah yep okay. i'm going to jump in for just really quickly uh for not planning ahead or anything you have great opening lines though we didn't know how it happened but when we woke up there was a dead horse in the street in front of the hotel it will be someone's attention the advantage when you don't start at the beginning is you can go back and sort of come up with a good opening line. Yeah, for as simple as snow, I think the opening line was the very last sentence I wrote for the novel. So I love that book. Okay. Oh, thank you. And you know, the line that Anne just brought up, I kind of wanted to ask about that. Uh, you have a short story, Hangers, in Careful and Other Stories, that starts with a major character obsessing over a dead man on her street and just thieves you start with the minor or with the major character obsessing over a dead horse outside the hotel is there something in this theme that you're trying to work out that you keep bringing it back <laughs> there probably is but it's funny that you mentioned hangers and um, thank you for a very obscure reference but it's like the, if you remember the character is watching mr ed on yes. on, on tv so maybe i combine the two Instead of the dead guy on the street, I put the dead horse. Maybe it's Mr. Ed out there that I'm obsessed with. <laughs> but, um, you know, obviously it's like one of the things about the novel is there are a number of allusions to reference to direct steals from other literature. And, uh, you know, a dead horse in the street is a pretty famous, you know, almost cliche now from Crime and Punishment. So, you know, it was a little nod there, but also it's, it deals with a larger theme of the book, which is um, these two thieves are sort of obsessed about the world in a way that they think they have it figured out. They think they see the world in a way that other people don't. And one of the themes of the book is looking and seeing, that people look at the world, but they don't actually see it. And that dead horse in the street is sort of a an immediate response to that. They they think they see one thing, but they sort of miss what's happening on the street. Okay. Now you have all of these Easter eggs that you've hidden in Just Thieves. Is there a reading list that goes with Just Thieves? There is a there is a citation at the back, but it doesn't cover all of them because what would the fun of that be? So there's at least at least three or four that I don't cite where they're from. Okay. So, has then, anybody, you know, oh, has anybody to your knowledge found all of them? Not all of them, no. But it's also, it's, it's one of those things like you do not need to have that knowledge to enjoy the book, but it's sort of okay. like for people who are thick in, the, thick in the weeds of noir film and noir fiction, they're there for your enjoyment. Okay. I was wondering if there was a prize or something for being the first one to point them all out. Yeah, we'll have to figure that out. Yeah, it'll, it'll be a trophy of some sort, I think. Yeah, that would be a good promotion. You get more yeah. people, you know, buy the book yeah. so they get the, uh, the free trophy or whatever it is. Um, now, you grew up around the characters in your novel. A little bit, yeah. So, um, 
you know, my, my father was uh, ex-military. He was both in World War II and Korea and uh, came out of that, I think, with a healthy um, anti-authoritarian attitude. Uh, when I was growing up, he was a juvenile probation officer, not a probation officer like Len that, that you write about with, with Matt, but juvenile. So uh, our house was sort of filled with um, kids in trouble, kids who needed a place to stay until either the court could deal with them or their families could deal with them. And then uh, when I was very young, my father also taught at the um, state penitentiary. And uh, what they told him was not to have personal relationships with the inmates. So he basically gave out his phone number and street address to lots of inmates. And so they came and stayed with us for some only for a night, some for extended periods of time. So. Um, I did see that side of the world, people who had been in and out of the criminal justice system. And then my father's father, my grandfather, was uh, chief of police. And um, a lot of my father's friends were cops, lawyers, social workers. So I always like to say that I sort of grew up at the intersection of, of right and wrong. Okay. Did this have any influence on your choice of subjects when you started writing? Is this why you're writing crime now? or? Probably. Um, I'm trying not to think about it too hard, but it certainly, you know, I, I think that I think that one of the things that taught me about was that my father sort of treated everybody the same. And so, um, you know, I think it afforded me a way, a way to look at other people and have some sort of sympathy to them or try to see the world the way they see it. Okay. Now you've got would you, four would you, I, will, I will I should ask you to turn that on you as well. Do you find that you you use your upbringing and, and career as a, over here? As a Air Force yeah. officer I, sure I in your writing? Uh, hold on. Sheila, can you mute yourself, please? Thank you. Um, not directly. And I've I grew up reading. Uh, crime and thriller books. I'm back when I was in the YA market. There was no YA market. I went directly from Encyclopedia Brown to John D. McDonald and Alistair McLean. And so that's what I was reading in junior high and continued reading those sorts of books. And so it was kind of natural when I started writing that I would write those kind of books. Uh, as far as the my military background, I get characters from that. I, and Carson is very much a composite of a number of women who I've known who were in either the Air Force or in the various police agencies that I've worked in. Uh, and so her character I've lifted from that. Some other characters I, I've lifted from that experience. The one thing that I got from my military intel uh, experience was that how to build a file, how to do research, how to organize information, uh, and how to digest it so it's understandable by other people. I, my specialty when I was in military intel was Korea and the Far East, and I haven't really said anything in Korea and the Far East. I'm staying as far away from Korea as I can, so I don't have to pass it through DOD in order to get it censored. But the skills that I learned from doing that kind of research, I've been able to pull into my writing just so I can organize how I do my research and what I do with the results from it. Yeah, I also think that one of the things that's really interesting, your, your novels are very grounded in the real. So it's yes. like, you know, you're, you, they take place all over the world. Yes. But there are, there are very factual elements in that world. And what I found out is that you may not have visited there, which a lot of people wonder if you've been to nightclubs in Ibiza or wherever, but that, you, that you've that you used your sort of research talents to find actual locations and streets and all of those things. And right. um, for for a fictional world, why, why do you think it's important to have that level of realistic detail in the world that you're creating? Well, I'm... Uh, unlike what you've been doing with your writing, where you kind of set your stories in an unnamed city, although I suspect most of them are in the Midwest, uh, because that 
that seems to be where they're from. Uh, I set well, my I stories in very specific is, uh, places. Taylor, you need to mute yourself, oh. please. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I'm going to go just put my truck on the street. So. Okay. You Somebody like else is on there too. Uh, so I, I set my stories in very specific places, and I figure if I'm going to set them there, I might as well use the place. Also, people, whether or not I've been there, people who read the book may very likely have been to those places. And so if I get it wrong, then they'll start sending me nasty letters. And, you know, you turn left at that corner, not right in order to get where you're going. Mm -hmm. You know, I do that with stories that are set in San Francisco or set in Los Angeles. You know, I, I know when people screw it up and it distracts me. So I figure if I'm going to use that city or that place, I'm going to do it as right as I can. Yeah. So as, as you mentioned, my world is a fictional world. And I think in all three novels, it's not a named location. But the very first response I got from As Simple as Snow is that I mentioned two streets, Twixt and Town, intersect. And someone came up to me and said, you know, Twixt and Town don't intersect. <laughs> <laughs> I said, maybe, in, maybe in your town, they, they don't intersect. But in my town, they, they, they do intersect. <laughs> right. And I like using real locations, too. So my characters usually stay in real hotels and eat at real restaurants. Uh, and, you know, drive real cars that you can really rent in those cities and so on and so forth. I figure it, it adds some authenticity yeah, to it. There, and I take that back for the, the new novel. They do actually, the characters go to Positano, Italy, which I think I mentioned. And when you said a real hotel, that reminded me because I do okay. describe an actual hotel, which might be the only time. Okay. Uh, you've got four books on your Amazon author page. Uh, your first and third books are YA. Uh, and John Green said that he got the idea for Looking for Alaska, which was one of his big books from As Simple as Snow. So that's some pretty serious YA cred. Why did you stop writing YA? Or have you? Is just Thieves kind of a diversion you're going to go back to writing YA? I, I try to think I go wherever the characters and story lead me. And I, I should say that the first book, As Simple as Snow, was published as an adult book, but it does have teenage protagonists. And I was sort of quickly, you know, sort of on the cusp of, of when people thought about YA as a, its own entity. And so it was published as an adult, adult title, but quickly became a YA audience. And then the second book, you know, I've sort of always written about that age, sort of high school, it's high school, okay. older high school it's kids. And in some ways, um, at the heart of Just Thieves, the genesis of it is a problem that the narrator gets into when he's 18. And they're still probably in their 20s. So I don't know if I've graduated, but it's like they're slightly older, not too much older, but they do have very distinct adult problems which obviously makes it, you know, sort of out of the realm of YA. And I think I think YA as a genre is also skewed much younger than it was when I started off. Yeah, I think the official definition for YA is protagonists who are 14 through 18. Yeah, and it used to be like, you know, they used to say it was like 16 to 24, so it's definitely migrated younger. Yeah, there's this thing called new adult which is, I guess, 18 through 22 or 24 now. Yeah, and I don't know how much of a thing that really is, but well, I don't you know. know either if that's sort of a marketing thing that hasn't really taken off. But, you know, the, uh, the characters in this book are immature at times. They certainly act much younger, but, you know, that might be a societal issue as well. Right. Are there any elements or themes in those first two books that you carried into Just Thieves? <laughs> I think I think the the first one is sort of a very much a twist on the sort of the idea of a mystery novel and it's sort of the the narrator of the book has to become his own detective to figure out why this girl disappeared and sort of the twist I took is that the reader also has to become a detective 
And, you know, that's probably goes back to my Encyclopedia Brown days like you. I sort of like described that book as Encyclopedia Brown, but without the conclusion at the end, you can look up. And so, you know, I think that's the theme. I tried to do a noir that that sort of was embrace the the genre, but also tried to twist it as well. Hello? Yeah. Sheila. Oh, he was worried. Yeah, Sheila. Yeah. Sheila. I can't get rid of her, so uh, we're going to have to. And I tried calling her, so. <laughs> okay, moving right along. Yeah, uh, all right, all uh, all four of your books are written in first person. Uh, what do you like about this particular point of view? And have you tried other POVs and decided to, to not do that? Uh, also, have you ever wanted the freedom to be able to switch away from your main POV character so we can see what the bad guys are doing, or in this case, the good guys are doing, uh, and heighten that dramatic tension? Uh, or are you content with just following your main character around uh, and experiencing things as he or she experiences them? Yeah, so what I was taught, and also it's like I've... Um... David Morrell was was my undergrad advisor when I was in college too, and he was also a person who sort of um, drilled it into my head that never, ever, ever use first person narrator. So <clears throat> perhaps that's why I use first person narrator, but he had a caveat or a, a proviso, which is that if you do use first person narrator, he should be unreliable. And um, I think I think for especially the first one, which I said is a mystery and really the narrator has to become his own detective to sort of sort through the evidence and find out what happens. And this one, um, it was incumbent that it be first person because it, there are points in the novel where the reader should know more than the narrator does. And the reader sees the world in a way the narrator can't. And that's sort of an important component of the book. Um, I, I sort of like, characters who are wrong in the world that they think they have the answers and don't have the answers which is sort of as you know sort of one of the bedrock themes of noir um, right. but i think that's that's much easier to get across in first person if you have third person it's hard to sort of be wrong about stuff okay i've Getting back to noir, I've read some discussions that have tried to make a distinction between noir and hard-boiled crime fiction. Do you think there's a difference, or and if so, what do you think it is? I think I think sort of one of the key differences is that um, the noir movement is, um, you know, for lack of a better word, existential. So it sort of gets to it gets to um, sort of the core questions that people have asked for a long time. Who are we? Identity is always a big issue. The ambiguity of our, our nature, um, as, as well as seeing the world as corrupt. I think hard-boiled often has, um, you know, there's a right and wrong in the world. Noir it sort of mixes all together. And I think that the ways that that's played out is that, um, Camus was hugely influenced by James N. Cain. In fact, there's a whole book written about the postman always rings twice and its influence on Camus, especially The Stranger. And that um, Sartre was re really influenced by Hammett and especially Red Harvest by Hammett. And it's like, think, think you don't have that philosophical outlook out of Hard Boiled, but you have it in Noir. Okay. So it's more of an attitude and a philosophy than it is yeah, story I think it's mechanics. A whole, yeah, <laughs> whole worldview, I think. But obviously, you know, people debate this, have debated it for a long time. Right. And I've been, actually, as I've been thinking about this and, you know, thinking about the character or about the questions, it came to me that pretty much all noir is hard-boiled but not all hard boiled is, is noir. I think that's true. Yeah, and I think like someone like Hammett, well, Hammett has his foot in a bunch of different camps because then you have the Thin Man series, but right. you know, he's, some, he's somebody who tried a lot of different approaches as well. Right, well, and that 
was probably him trying to spread his market appeal too, because <laughs> Thin Man appealed to a, a different yeah. market segment than the really hard boiled stuff did. If so. only he had an agent. If only he had an agency model, Lance, he could have he could have know. solved a lot of that early on. I know exactly. Well, too bad for him, but <laughs> you know, we can not follow in his footsteps. And that's right. He did okay for himself. Yeah. Something in yeah. there. The interesting yeah. thing was he was very unhappy about being so popular for the books that became movies. His daughter has been here several times and has always mm -hmm. said that he resented the fact that he was popular for something as lowly as these books that became movies, even though the series was so popular. I'm sure it made him money, but he wasn't happy. Yeah. Huh. Has she ever mentioned what he would have rather been known for? Well, his deeper uh, the books he wrote that were deeper and didn't become movies. He wrote some wonderful books, but he felt that he was only noticed for, he was being picky, let's face it. He was noticed. <laughs> He was known for everything, and um, as one who has enjoyed those movies over the years, when you find them on television, they were fun, and people needed fun in those days. Yeah, there are plenty of authors who are unhappy with the movies that are made out of their books, but but he is. There are some good movies, to your point, made out of his books. Exactly. It's true. Yeah. That's true. And I, I would be happy to accept whatever amount of money some producer wanted to throw at me to make a movie of one of my books. So they could do what they want at that point. I'm surprised that hasn't happened, to be quite honest with you, Lance. I mean, you know, one, they're a lot of fun. And, and two, they are, I think they are a, a subversion of the genre in many ways as well. And, and if, you know, I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit about the ways that you sort of look, look at the genre and sort of undermine some of its key tenants. Well, uh, Matt is a bad boy. Uh, Ex-con, he was, uh, he was a crooked gallery assistant in a crooked gallery. He absolutely did all the things that he got accused of and then he got run into prison for and he has not really reformed uh, because now he's just using this particular set of skills that he came up with uh, for the DeWitt agency and getting paid very well for cheating and defrauding the clients as well as whoever it is that he's been set out after to uh, so I know that the bad boy protagonist is is big and it's something that other people have used but usually they've reformed and in this case he hasn't and he's got d very definite ideas about how the economy works and especially how the art world works and he's not very complimentary about it uh, and he sees uh, he mentioned in the first book that uh, some of the things that he did were kind of his tax on silly rich people uh, so he is not striving to become one of them. He's, he's got a very practical end in mind. He's trying to pay off his, you know, half a million dollars that he owes uncle Sam and, uh, restitution and so forth. And you can't do that working at Starbucks. And I guess the other thing is that he works at Starbucks, mm -hmm. Uh, when he's not out running around for the agency. So I've never quite known what some of the private uh, detectives do in between cases, but well, we know what he does. He wipes down tables and he pulls coffee for people. Uh, and I have thought- and, and, But it's not, it's not entirely a front for him either because no. he, he's, he's a complex character in that he, he is not good or bad. and. And in some respects to Noir, he sees, he sees these corrupt systems and realizes that he has to operate in somewhat of a corrupt fashion to sort right. of, you know, to get good done, to put it bluntly, but to sort of accomplish what he needs to accomplish. Right. And then Carson is an ex-cop. And being a cop was her dream job. She ended up getting cashiered because she was framed for corruption by one of her superiors. 
uh, at about the same time she found out that her husband was cheating on her with basically anything with you know two x chromosomes and then she found out that her father was in hawk to a, the russian gangster that she'd been trying to take down so you know her entire world just turned completely a crap so she's still got kind of the cop instincts and she wants to protect the vulnerable. She wants to punish the bad guys, but at the same time, she's not above mugging the bad guys. So something that happened in both of the files books and also both of her adventures books is that if she takes somebody down, you know, first thing she does is go through their wallet and take the cash. And then if they've got a better weapon than she's got, she'll take that. Uh, and then move on and doesn't have any qualms about doing that at all. So she's kind of stepped over the gray line too, but she still has a, a very well-developed sense of morality and duty uh, that carries her through some of these fairly outre situations that she finds herself in. And, and she and Matt obviously have worked together, but they they see the world in totally different ways. Their sort of their problem-solving approach is completely opposed yes matt talks his way out of trouble yeah and he's always been that way and he's the typical con man in that he'll get himself into trouble by talking and he'll get himself out of trouble by talking uh, he's never picked up a weapon in any of the three books he's never gotten a fight you know fight he got conked over the head and dragged into a van in the first book but uh, he's never actually hit anybody in these three books he's not the typical crime hero because he doesn't do that carson on the other hand has no problems going kinetic on people and so that's she's the muscle and that was another thing that i kind of turned over because usually the woman is the beautiful sex object and the guy is doing all the action in this case you know matt is the the pretty one and Carson's the one who's doing all the action and she's rescuing him. So, and that was something that I really wanted to do in this series and make that dynamic. Yeah, and in fact, in one of your novels, you completely sort of subvert, um, you know, for lack of a better word, the misogyny that's sort of rampant in a lot of crime fiction, and especially in the crime fiction that I'm more familiar with in the 50s, where you describe this absolutely gorgeous woman and you think the... It's going to go one way and then what you find out is it's actually a painting that is sort of the object of people's desire not the woman itself which i thought was like a really sly sly way of sort of like to um yeah to tweak tweak a lot of those descriptions that occur in crime fiction right that was uh, stealing ghosts so it was the second of the files series and i i wanted to do mm -hmm. that and a couple of reviewers actually commented on that. Oh, you know, here we go. You know, another, you know, drooling description <laughs> of a woman. And then, oh, it's a painting. And, and now Matt's going to steal it. And so because I wanted Dorotea, who is the subject of the painting, to become somebody that Matt wanted to rescue. I mean, because nobody really cares if a painting or this dead thing goes back to where it belongs. But if Dorotea became a character and if she became you know, a real person to the audience, then they would care that Dorotea gets to go back home to where she belongs. Uh, and that was just the beginning of it. I had to get Matt hooked. So then the audience would get hooked and they'd become invested in Dorotea and all of the various iterations of her that show up during that book end up where they're supposed to go. Does that help? Uh, now, uh, I don't know if either of you can see it, but you have several great questions on here that you might want to address. Are you able to see your questions? We can now. Okay. Uh, uh, ben had some, Catherine commented, Marilyn did. In our current world, who decides a masterpiece? Value to steal. Ben, your dog has a comment. <laughs> Is that Sharon's dog? I don't think so. No, it's Ben. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. 
uh okay well greg your characters in just oh, did you, did you answer that? about the value of the thing that they were trying to steal so why don't you take that question well i think this is more your bailiwick which is about the art world but but you know i think i what my characters talk about is what has value and what they determine is that anything that has monetary value if it can be bought it can be bought again um and i think that's somewhat true in the art world you know if in fact, a lot of these thefts, the uh, high profile thefts, they believe are sort of pr private owners who want who want this piece of art and that it's probably hanging in someone's basement and that isn't really being traded on any sort of marketplace. Um, and my characters, what they figure out is it's the things that you can't purchase that are actually worth worth most to steal. And that is things that have sentimental value that can't be replaced. But um, What's, what's your perspective on in terms of the art market, which is so inflated now and certainly with the, you know, the digital art, the NFTs and, and those types of things? Well, the art market, especially the high end of the art market is influenced by fashion. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of money that's sloshing around it from especially the uh, great Wall Street boom that we had in the, the end of the 90s and the in the 2000s a lot of people who were getting a lot of money and wanting s social cred got involved in art because that was where the where high-end society was supposed to be and they got involved in contemporary art for a number of reasons first of all old masters where they are is pretty much where they are so if they're in a museum, they're going to stay in the museum. If they're in a private collection, they're going to stay in the private collection. So that area is not available to modern collectors, except in fairly rare occasions. But the contemporary art market is still in flux. Uh, there's still pieces being made by some of the name artists and the others are still around and they're in circulation. So it's still possible to get them if you're willing to spend enough crazy money to do it. Then also with that, with the entree of all these people who haven't been in the art market before and they're not the old line collectors and they haven't developed their own expertise in the art is that we have art advisors now. And these are people who tell rich people how to spend their money to get a quote unquote good art collection. And they have fashions. And a lot of them came from the same place. You're working either at the auction houses or in the museums. And they have their own kind of orthodoxy. And you know, these are the people you have to have to have a serious contemporary art collection. And so they're all giving, telling their clients to buy the same stuff. So you've got all these people who are following advisors or have decided that this is their way to become part of you know high society, uh, spending money to chase the same relatively limited number of pieces. And that's how the prices have gotten so completely insane. Uh, and it's not out of, out of the question for somebody who's got more money than they can possibly spend in multiple lifetimes to decide I'm going to spend $200 million on a painting that was made 30 years ago. And, and what you write about, which is, you know, this is a system then that is ripe for manipulation, corruption, yes. and yes, and, and really is closed to normal people who may have that of money. It's a closed set that a lot of these people are working in. Yes, exactly. Uh, there was a, a case that happened 10 or 15 years ago, uh, the Nodler Gallery, you know, went the oldest art gallery in the United States, got involved in selling uh, forged contemporary paintings that were being done by this Chinese guy in a garage in Queens. And they sold you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of fake contemporary paintings and everybody bought it because they were good enough to be plausible. And also they were being sold through the Nodler Gallery, which had been around forever and was you know, very prestigious and very reliable. And so everybody thought, well, of course, these, are, these must be right. And so they were until they weren't. Uh, and it's a kind of a microcosm of the entire thing, an example of how the market worked 
in that this was able to go on for like 10 years before somebody finally figured out what was happening. But it was people relying on other people to tell them that this is okay. And it was okay because this gallery, which was reputable, was selling it to them and not actually doing the due diligence to say, is this really a Rothko? Is this really a Pollock? Uh, and because they didn't have to do that. They were being told by people who were supposed to know that this was it. And they were spending serious money on this art. And most of them ended up losing that money because you know, the gallery went belly up and the Chinese guy in Queens went back to China. And so he wasn't available anymore. And the dealer who was feeding him into the system didn't have any money. And eventually I'll do something with that case because it's a great case. And yeah. there was a movie made about it, which was a good a documentary, uh, but it is kind of a, an example of how that closed loop system works. Mm -hmm. And and also works in the the book world as well, the book antiquities. Yes. You know, there's a famous case about Galileo's drawings of the moon that were all fraudulent and and suckered a lot of people into believing that they were authentic. Yes. Yes, exactly. And there's I believe there's a couple of questions on there for you that I saw shooting past. Okay. Uh, no, the whole thing here on, on the little thing I'm working on. Okay, Marilyn uh, asked, uh, who inspires you to keep writing? So, Greg? I guess I do. You know, I've been doing it. I've been doing it so long. It's just something I that I do. And I don't know if you're the same way, Lance. As, you know, I write every day, and whether it comes to something or not, that that has yet to be seen. But you know, it's it's just something that I've done since I was very young, and something I continue to do. And I sort of look at it that, you know, being published is sort of the is not the goal. It's sort of the happy byproduct of of writing. And um, did you did you always write Lance or did you come to this later? I did. The very first fiction I remember writing was in fourth grade and it was Adam 12 fan fiction, <laughs> which should both tell you how old I am and also where my brain was at when I started doing this. Uh, my first full length work was a nonfiction piece on the Gulf of Tonkin incident that I wrote for my civics class in high school. You could imagine the joy in the teacher's face when I came, came in with this brick that I turned in for my paper. Uh, and then I fell out of it, you know, college, career, so on and so forth, didn't have time. And then I ended up going to Intel school in San Angelo, Texas. And if you've never been to San Angelo, it's a city of a hundred some odd thousand that's in West Texas and it's surrounded by a hundred miles in any direction of cotton fields. So I needed some way to entertain myself. And so I came up with some characters to keep me company. I was significantly older than the other people who were in my Intel class and didn't really socialize with them very much. Uh, and so I started writing again and I thought, you know, I really like writing. And so I picked it up and I've been writing nonstop, you know, ever since. And I think that's who I inspire me to do it. I enjoy the writing, uh, getting it published and having other people read my stories is kind of icing on the cake. Uh, but I still, I enjoy the process of writing. I enjoy the research. I enjoy creating and manipulating the lives of my characters. I guess I'm kind of a sadist that way. Uh, and that's what keeps me writing. I also think I saw a question about short stories on there somewhere. I don't get the full screen, so I have to rely on you two. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm, short I'm looking stories the same way. Um, oh, yes. Here we go. Mr. Galloway, do you yeah. approach, approach short stories the same way as just start with no clear end? Also, do you have a favorite book that a new reader might start with? Um, I think I approach it the same way. Um, what happens is that, you know, since I write every day, I'm not always working on one thing. I work on different things. And sometimes they're short stories, sometimes they're poems, sometimes they're parts of novels. And, you know, unfortunately, I never really have a clear idea of what I'm doing. And in fact, um, one of the things with Just Thieves is that I got stuck at one point and, um, 
I remembered that Raymond Chandler was famous for cannibalizing his own writing. So he would go back and look at short stories he had done and see if there were things that he could do. So I went back and looked at, looked at one of my short stories, which was about this young kid sort of going to his father's friend for help. And I realized I could sort of use that and that sort of unlocked the character for me as well and just Steve. So it's like sometimes, sometimes you don't know where it's going to lead. And, so, and luckily it led to being part of a novel, just something I had written, written off to the side. Um, and then Catherine, I'm, I'm, do you mean just in general, a, a favorite book that a reader might start with or a noir book, crime fiction book? Um, Why don't you all unmute yourself so you can ask questions? Catherine, can you unmute? There you go. If you are going to recommend a new reader, because I confess I haven't read you before, which book would, would you recommend I start with? Or, or just anyone, pick one? Yeah, I, I, my first book, As Simple as Snow, that's like a high school romance that ends up being this mystery. Um, so if you like mysteries, that's probably a good one. This Just Thieves is sort of, uh, you know, sort of a dark, dark crime fiction book. So if that's your thing, that would, be, would also be a good place to start. How about you, Lance? I mean, obviously with the duet, would you start at the beginning or would you go, go to one of the standalones first? Well, uh, it depends on what you like. If you're into action adventure thrillers, then I would say start with Doha 12, uh, which is my first published book. And it's a straight ahead spy, spy thriller. And then go to uh, Zerato, which is the first Carson book. And you know, that's again, another you know, action thriller uh, type thing. And then you know, move on to Engano. If you're more into mystery uh, heist type books, then I'd say look at the collection and go and with that I one. I saw that Ben asked a couple of times what each of you were reading currently. Okay, you want to start with that, Greg? Um, I'm reading this Russian, I'm not sure what it is. I guess it's nonfiction. It's called Sketches of the Criminal World. Um, Russian writer Volman Shamalov, I think, I could be wrong on the last name, but he did Time in the Gulag. Um, and I got interested in the book because basically in the first paragraph, he talks about how um, writers don't understand criminals and we sentimentalize criminals because we've never met them, which I don't entirely agree with, but I thought it would be worth a good read. And he's a great writer too. Okay. I've, my current read is not nearly as highbrow as that. It's Poppy Redfern and the Fatal Flyers. Uh, and I should explain myself there because it's not typically something that I would read. Uh, I've been looking at a particular subgenre of historical mysteries, which can be summed up as uh, British women survive World War I and go out to solve crimes. Okay. Uh, and so I've been looking at, I did Maisie Dobbs of, and I did um, Maggie Hope, you know, Mr. Churchill's secretary, and now I'm with Poppy Redfern. And one thing I've noticed that they're all redheads. I'm not sure why that is, but it's, it's kind of interesting. So here, here's a question, Lance. Do you read, this is not say you don't take enjoyment from reading, but do you read for enjoyment or is everything to sort of, you know, fill the tank, so to speak? I read for enjoyment after I get done writing something. Yeah. And it kind of cleanses my palate. Yep. And right. then I'm reading for, you know, what's the next thing going to be? Yeah. Uh, ben Fouché says, to me, 39 deaths and Simple as Snow have a lyrical epic simplicity. Has anyone approached you to adapt the musical format? No, Ben should, though. That's my, that's my cousin, by the way. <laughs> oh, okay. So he's a plant. He's a that plant. A question. Mm -hmm. Okay. I like that. He's one of my relatives out there in California. Okay. Okay. That you'll come visit next year. Yeah. What are, uh, I'm going to ask each of you what you're working on now. What we can expect next. Where, where are you in the agency, Lance? Well, that's an excellent question. I'm kind of at a crossroads right now. Uh, 
I've got the three books in the files series and the two books in the adventure series. And to be perfectly honest, they're not selling to the level that I would like. Uh, and so I have to think, do I double down and do I you know, spend another year writing another one of those? Or do I try something else that I think might be more successful? Which is one of the reasons I'm looking at this subgenre of British women survive World War I and start solving crimes. And the genesis to that is I belong to a critique group. And they've been through all five of the DeWitt related books at this point. And they started badgering me about, well, you know, when are we going to get the Allison book? Allison's the, the head of the DeWitt agency. And I said, well, you know, uh, Allison doesn't really do that kind of thing. And so, well, where did Allison come from? Maybe, you know, maybe it's Allison's grandmother or something. You know, what, you know, how did she do that? And we started spitballing and came up with this really outlandish idea for uh, Allison's grandma, uh, who is a spy and an aviatrix and a cabaret singer and you know, the mistress of presidents and prime ministers and so forth. And I started thinking about it and say, you know, that would be pretty cool. And so I've been thinking about, you know, a, a character who would be actually Allison's great grandmother, who is an aviatrix uh, in the 30s, getting involved in adventures in that time. It would be kind of not so much a female Indiana Jones, but what did Marion Ravenswood do after Indy dumped her for the second time? Okay. Because she didn't go back to Nepal to run the bar because the bar burned down. So, you know, she's also not going to marry a dentist and settle down and in the picket fence and the, uh, the cottage. So I figured she'd go out and have adventures. And so what kinds of things would she do? And so I'm looking at that. I don't know if I'm going to commit to that yet. I'm trying to learn the genre a little bit more and see if there's any possibility that I can survive in it. Uh, but if there is, maybe I will try that. Otherwise, I'll find something else for Carson to do and finish out her first trilogy and move on from there. How about you? Well, you know, I classically don't know what I'm doing at any time until it's sort of done. So the thing I'm working on now is... Um, involves uh, a guy who's worked for a single company for 15 years or so and has helped them through the pandemic and sort of feels like he saved the company through the pandemic. And once the pandemic is over, uh, he gets fired. And so he has, he has questions about who he is, what has he done with his life, and uh, makes a lot of bad choices after that. And one of those choices is that he's going to get revenge against his boss. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I can believe that with what we're going <laughs> I know it's not it's not like me to be grounded in reality, but I'm, <laughs> I'm going to give it a shot. Okay. Um, I think this has been a very interesting panel. Um, I hope everyone is unmuted so that you can ask questions if you haven't typed them in. And if there's a question that was typed in that we haven't addressed, somebody speak up because unfortunately I can't see them here. Okay. Catherine, you said one. Allison did say she'd been in prison, just not in the U.S. That's true. She did say that. <laughs> so that, that would imply that she had done something wrong to get incarcerated. So that might be a starting point, but I would like to see another uh, Carson book because I really like Carson. Okay. Oh, thank you for that. So and please, and please recommend to all of your friends that they buy the Carson books because then that will give me a inspiration to write more Carson books. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I want to, I think we've, uh, if we've done it, I'd love to hear more from either author. If you have something to, you want to talk about your future work, um, you both touched on it. Um, you have more research to do, Lance, and you, yours, Gregory, sounds like it, it's all, almost always already there, in your mind, anyway. A little bit. We'll see where it yeah. goes. <laughs> yeah, and I can 
I think many of us can relate to someone being frustrated by the time we get out of this pandemic, if and when. Uh, this so. has been very interesting. Uh, I want to remind everyone that uh, the books are available at Book Carnival. Uh, all you have to do is let me know. All of them know how to do that. Uh, this has been a wonderful session, and I really appreciate it. Uh, like I said, I'll look forward to it being in person next year, Gregory, for you. And that Lance is around the corner, so that's not an issue. <laughs> um, but I do appreciate your time, both of you today, and it's been enlightening and fun. Okay. And so remember Greg? the books, uh, Just Thieves and Engano. They're okay. here, and we're ready to sell them. Okay. Thank you so much. Greg, Love thanks for being here and everybody in attendance. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank bye bye. Now. Thanks for uh, sharing with me here. I Thank appreciate, you, Lance. Appreciate the backup. And I hope that uh, we'll get to appear together sometime else. I hope so as well. It's been great talking to you. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Okay.